Open your Bibles this morning, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, 3, right, yeah, 1 Peter chapter 3, how do you know? Because you said it earlier. Did I really? Yes. Oh. Oh, phew. I thought I was losing it. Okay, we're going we're to take a detour just for a, you know, just for a day for, from Romans because I've had some conversations with people recently, two different people who don't even know each other, and one of them asked about fallen angels. And so today I'd like to set, or not set, not set, but I'd like to shed, shed some light on that subject. And then in conjunction with that subject, it's two different questions that both lead to the same, to the same answer. And uh, one, one of the other things was what did, when Jesus Christ was in the grave for three days, you know, the verses we'll look at say that, or some people say that he went to hell in those three days. And the verses we'll look at are, there's a lot of speculation that has been concocted about those three days that Jesus Christ. So I want to look at passages today that address this subject. And, you know, we'll make some deductions that will lead to our conclusion. And, you know, there's so many different views about this that, you know, you remain humble in times like this. And you don't, you know, impose your will on the Word of God when there are variables like what, like what, like what you'll see today, okay? But I can tell you that many conflicting points of view have been invented about the verses that we're going to look at today. And the passage that we're going to look at is called the, the descent, the dissension passage. Because it's where Jesus Christ descended, but there's also a lot of dissension, like division over it, okay? So, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, and beginning at verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is, eight souls were saved by water. The idea that is associated with this passage of Scripture is that when Jesus Christ died, between the time of his death and the time of his resurrection, we know he was in the earth. Okay, obviously he was in the earth. Matter of fact, Matthew 12, 40 says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he was in the heart of the earth. Definitely because he said he would be. The question is, what was he doing while he was there? And First Peter the verses that we're looking at, chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, you know, that he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So the idea is that when he was in the heart of the earth, he went down to the people who had been alive in the days of Noah, who perished in the flood, and he preached unto them. That's the thought associated with these verses. Now remember, when he was on the cross, he told the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And the teaching associated with that is that he went down into hell to suffer the punishment for sins, to, 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 to bear the wrath of God, 
And then after sins were paid, he went from the side where Abraham and Lazarus are into the torment side, and he preached to those people. These people. That's what the teaching associated with this is, okay? Now, first of all, let's, I want to clear something up. Jesus Christ did not go to hell to pay for your sins, okay? That is not what happened. Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross. Finished. Done. <laughs> The wages of sin is death. And he was made sin for us who knew no sin. That's where he paid the penalty. Okay, when he said it is finished, somebody just said that. Yeah. It is finished. Paid in full on the cross. That's where the penalty was paid, okay? And that penalty was accepted by God. We read in Isaiah 53, verse 11, He, God, shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God was satisfied with the sacrifice of his own son. After Jesus Christ was made to be sin, and he bore our sin on the cross, and he paid the penalty... He died. He died with a body full of sin. Think about that. The holy, harmless, undefiled, separate Son of God was made sin. I told a story a long time ago. When I lived in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, we rented a, a, a garage that had been converted into an apartment next to a house, and a little old lady was rented that out to us, and she had a big old German shepherd. Well, one day she died, and her sister from New York, who called, and we, I was in contact with her, and so, you know, I went in her, that lady's house, and when I walked in that house, about one million fleas jumped on my legs, yeah, and I was covered with fleas. That's what it was like for Jesus Christ on the cross when God made him to be sin. He took all of the sin of the world on him. I remember that after I got saved, <laughs> that flea incident. Okay. But he died with a body full of sin. And then he was buried. He took those sins down with him into the grave. When he rose from the dead, he left all those sins there and he rose to newness of life. And when you believe and you trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you are buried with him. And you bring your sins to the grave with him. And when you rise up, you leave your sins in the grave and you rise up to newness of life and you are complete in Christ and you're declared righteous and you're justified by grace through faith. And after that, you're forgiven all trespasses in Christ. You know, I, I, I always say you were saved, but your flesh wasn't. You still have your flesh to contend with in this world. Lot, there's, and there's a lot of things in the flesh that can go wrong. Attitudes and thoughts, it's not just physical sins. It's attitudes and thoughts and, you know, there's a whole lot of things that, that can, that, that, but there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. And after they're saved, that flood just keeps pouring and pouring like Niagara Falls just flowing on you continually without ever ending and it has to be that way because if you die with one sin in you you can't go to heaven because you would pollute heaven amen so the full and complete payment 
of sin was made at the cross. He did not have to go to hell to pay for our sin. Okay? If the cross did not forgive our sin, nothing else will do. Okay? So the question that people have now is what did he preach to them? Okay, what did he preach? Someone said he went down there and he preached the doom of the lost, the eternal damnation of the lost. Like they didn't know that? Right? They knew that. Someone said he went there to offer them a second chance. Well, you know, that's tomfoolery foolishness. Okay, nobody gets a second chance. You know, I, I have often said, oh, as a matter of fact, Abraham in Lazarus' bosom said, there's a great gulf fixed between you and me so that uh -uh, you're there, you're staying there, nobody can cross that great gulf. I've often said that when you die, the last door that clicks on your heels is the last door you enter and you can't turn around and walk out, whichever one that is, there or there. When that door clicks on your heels, it's forever. It's for eternity. Some say that uh, he went down there to preach or announce his victory over Satan. That's popular associated with this doctrine here. You know, I'm the victorious one. <laughs> well, why would he only have done it to the people in Noah's day? Right? Because the, the verses that we're looking at have to do with Noah's day. But he didn't go there to preach that because that was still a mystery. That was a mystery that would be revealed to Paul. Only Paul would preach that during the dispensation of the grace of God. All right? So it's called a secret. It was hidden God. That's part of the mystery program that was revealed to Paul. So that's certainly not something that Jesus Christ went and revealed to those people before Paul got it, because Paul says what he's preaching in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. I would say alive or dead. All <laughs> right? Not made, made known to them, okay? So, what is this talking about? For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. We need to pay attention to the words here. Okay, notice, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached. He didn't go himself. By which he went means he went by the Spirit. Now, we'll come back to this, we'll come back to this, okay? Because, notice it also says, not unto the souls in prison, but unto the spirits in prison. So, who are the spirits in prison? What? I said I was going to talk about fallen angels, I shouldn't have said that. I gave, him, I gave away the secret. No, listen. Are angels called spirits in the word of God? Where? Well, let me help you. Psalm 104, verse 4, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. In Hebrews chapter 1, Verse 13, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? So angels are called spirits. Are they not ministering spirits? Yes, they are. They are ministering spirits. 
were they ever in prison is the question. Well, we read in 2 Peter chapter 2, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, delivered them into chains of darkness? That sounds like a dungeon to me. That sure sounds like a prison. When did that happen? Notice verse 5. And spared not. And the verse begins with and, which is a continuing word, right? And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. These two things happened simultaneously. The angels were cast into hell and delivered into chains of darkness at the same time that he spared not the old world, but brought the flood upon the world. These two things happened at the same time. Okay? So one of the questions I had received is, if angels, in Genesis 6, saw the daughters of men, and they produced giants way back there, if that's go going to happen again in the tribulation period, <coughs> don't angels need to find the daughters of men now in the dispensation of grace? Because if they wait till the tribulation period, those things will only be seven years old. It's, good, it's a good question. Made me put this message together and think about it. Okay, their seed will only get to be seven years old. So, but here's the thing. According to these verses, they're in chains of darkness reserved unto judgment. They're not coming out of there. What will happen in the tribulation period, Revelation chapter 9 talks about an angel given a key and opens up the bottomless pit. And out of there comes a lot of trouble. Hell on wheels. Right? They're coming from there. They're being released. They're not going to be mating with the daughters of men. At least, at, at least I don't see that. Maybe there's something I'm missing. You know, I don't know everything. Okay? So I don't see fallen angels doing the same thing in the tribulation period as they did back in Genesis chapter 6. This is saying that's when everything was destroyed and Noah was saved. The eighth, Noah the eighth person. What was happening in those days before the flood? By the way, Noah, the eighth person, think about this. Noah's not the eighth from Adam. He's the eighth person. Why does it say the eighth person? Well, here, just imagine this, okay? Noah's building an ark, 120 years, by which he condemned the world, Hebrews 11 says, right? So Noah's building the ark. Everybody thinks he's crazy. He's preaching to them, God's going to judge. Yeah, yeah, right, Noah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll get over it, Noah. <laughs> right? <laughs> His children, who knows what they believe, right? So the ark is built. They're out in the middle of where? The desert? Well, okay, and where, where's his children? They're not all sitting, sitting near, near the, the, the ark waiting for the rain to start. They're like, you know, they're doing their thing. And then all of a sudden, what does Noah do? Hey, get over there! Get in the ark! Because the door is open, right? The door is open. Hey, where's your mother? Go get your brother. Go get, right? And okay, so get in, get in, get in, get in, get in. It's, start, it's starting to pour. It's starting to rain. 
Get in, get in. He pushes the last one in, and Noah is the eighth. And then the Bible said God closed the door. Because there must have been other people going, he was right, let's go. No, you didn't believe. One door, one way. Right? So Noah was the eighth. But before the flood, were there not some strange things happening? Things that today we look at and go, <laughs> angels with the daughters of men right before the flood. We read in Jude chapter 1, verse 6, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So that says the same thing 2 Peter 2, 5 said. 2, 4, and 5. Verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. The people in Sodom went after strange flesh. What strange flesh? My wife said they went after the angels that appeared to Lot. Okay, well, what happened? What, what, what was going on with these angels? They left. It says they kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. They left the place that God created them to function in. And they also went after strange flesh. So when was this angelic activity taking place? Well, it's Genesis chapter 6. You can turn there if you want. I'll put the verses here. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto men, that they saw the sons of God. That the sons of God saw, sorry, the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made him. Now there's a lot in this message of Scripture that has controversial material and much heated debate has been leveled at these verses. There are some people who call others crazy and insane for saying what I'm about to say concerning these verses. So if you agree with me today in what I'm going to say, there will be people who call you crazy and insane also. Okay? So, maybe I'll be alone in this. Maybe I'll be in good company. <laughs> so, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and, the da and daughters were born unto men, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives which all of, of all which they chose. Now I want you to notice some things. We have the sons of God. We have the daughters of men. We absolutely know who the daughters of men are. Notice it does, these verses do not say 
the daughters of the sons of God. It says the daughters of men. Okay? And notice that the sons of God took. They took them wives. It doesn't seem to say that they asked for their hands in marriage. Okay? They took them wives, notice, of all which they chose. I'll take you, and I'll take you, and I'll take you. There was some taking going on. Right? So, who are these sons of God? Well, there are two types of sons of God. There are two types of sons of God. Those in the Old Testament, and then there are sons of God after Jesus Christ comes into the world, they're different. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, first, Job chapter 38, verse 5, speaking of the earth. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? God's talking about the earth says it's fastened, right? Some verses of say it's the, the earth is immovable. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So this is at the creation. The earth is being made and formed and fastened here. Was, did man exist? Were men created then? Okay, so the sons of God sure can, surely cannot be men. So it's angels, right? Okay, now notice in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 3. I won't read all the names. I'm reading the last two verses. Which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malil. Malalil, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. All the names before Adam are a result of the reproductive cycle in the human race. Only Adam is the son of God. How does, how does Adam become the son of God? Adam was created by God himself. Adam is a personal creation of God. Both Adam and angels are the personal creation of God himself. One of the major differences between Adam and and angels, Adam had a body. Angels did not. It's one of the major differences. However, angels can take on human bodies. They become strange flesh. Now you say, why do I say that? Well, remember Genesis chapter 18? The angels that visited Abraham? Three of them? The next chapter is, that, is Genesis chapter 19. Two angels came, it says, two angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah while Lot was sitting in the gate. And when Lot saw them, he went out to meet them and he bowed himself before them. He recognized they were men, but there was something unique about them. And then we read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, that some have entertained angels unaware. Unaware 
that it was an angel. But it was an angel in a human body. Okay? So in these verses, the sons of God, angels, put on the bodies of men and intermixed with the daughters of men. According to Jude 1.6, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. They left their own habitation. And they came and meddled when they weren't supposed to. Okay? So in these verses, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. When did he go and preach to them? Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Notice very carefully, this does not say that Jesus Christ himself went into the heart of the earth and preached to the people who were judged by the flood. These verses are not saying that. These verses, verse 19, verse 19 says, that he went by the Spirit. Now, how does that work? How does that work? I'm going to show you. We read in Zechariah chapter 7, 12. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, speaking of Israel, lest they should hear the law. Notice. And the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Notice, okay? It's the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent. Oh, how did he send his words? In his spirit. The spirit of God carried the words, but how were they delivered to Israel? by the former prophets. The words came from God, were carried by the Holy Spirit, and delivered through the mouths of the prophets, by which he came and preached. Notice, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 30. Yet many years, that's, didst thou forbear them. That's God. God forbears Israel. That means he has patience with them, okay? and testified against them. How did he testify against them? By thy spirit. Okay, now how did the spirit bring the testimony that testified against them? In thy prophets. In thy prophets. Yet they would not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the land of the people of the lands. The prophets were the vessels that the Holy Spirit spoke through. That's how God reached them. Notice Acts chapter 20, 28, verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. How did the Holy Ghost speak? By Isaiah the prophet. We read this in 2 Peter chapter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's how God communicates with men by the Spirit through the prophets. One more example, Ephesians 2, speaking of Jesus Christ, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, 
having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. Let me ask you this. Did Jesus Christ himself come and preach peace to us who were far off? No, he did not. No, he did not. Paul received the revelation. Paul received his message by revelation. The Holy Spirit gave Paul the words and Paul penned them down and we have them today. Jesus Christ preached to us by the Spirit through the apostle to the Gentiles. Now look at this verse again. The last part of verse 18. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went. By which he went. Quickened by the Spirit, by which he went. He did go by the Spirit and preach through Noah. He preached through Noah for 120 years. Notice Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, My Spirit shall not always strive with man. But it wasn't God's Spirit. It was God's Spirit the way it's always done, carried by the Holy Spirit, and then pushed out of the mouth of a prophet. And notice... For that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. How long did Noah preach for? A hundred twenty years. This is a prophecy that they're going to be destroyed in a hundred twenty years if they don't repent. And notice something very interesting in this, in this verse, okay? Notice this. For that he also, that's man, he also, do you see those words? Shall not with man, for that he also is flesh. Man also is flesh. Why does he say that? Why does he say man is also flesh? Because the sons of God had taken on flesh also. And they were there. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Okay? And when did he, by the Spirit, preach through Noah unto the spirits? Verse 20. Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is, eight souls were saved by water. It was during the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing. So those who say that Jesus Christ went into the heart of the earth to preach to the spirits in prison, doesn't make sense to me because this clearly and plainly states this happened when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. And when the flood came, eight souls were saved. And notice in connection with those who were saved, that should be differentiated from those who were preached to. Notice that it's not, and he preached unto the souls. He preached unto the spirits. It's eight souls that were saved, but it's the spirits, the angels, that were preached to. So in this passage of scripture, with the other verses about angels, we see the judgment of both men and angels. As a matter of fact, the last part of 1 Peter chapter 3, the last verse of 1 Peter chapter 3 is the end result. Notice, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. That's the conclusion of the matter of what happened in the, pre the verses that are talking about. That's who he's preaching. Okay, so the point of this message, okay, and believe it or not, I'm done. Because I, I just wanted to help, hopefully help somebody understand this. The point being that it was not Jesus Christ 
that went to preach to the spirits. Now, we don't know what was preached to those spirits. The Bible doesn't tell us. What did he say? What, what, did, the whole, what did the spirit say through note? Well, obviously it had to do with judgment, repent. The, God's, it's going to rain. I'm building an ark. Get ready. The flood is coming. Right? One of the main questions concerning this is what did Jesus Christ preach to the spirits in prison? And the point I want to make is that they were communicated to in the same way that God has always communicated with man. By the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, through a man, through a prophet, through someone, not me. You know, there are people who think that Paul was an apostle. He was an apostle back there for that age. But then, throughout the centuries, God raised up other men. Luther was a man. He replaced Paul. You know, Darby was a man. He replaced Paul. Uh, other people were men. They replaced Paul. There are, there, are, there are groups that teach that. And then you arrive at their prophet today. We have our prophet today. That's who we listen to. You know that, you know that exists, right? Yes, that exists in our world. Yes, that exists in our world. They don't understand that Paul said, preach no other doctrine. That I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. We don't need another apostle to the Gentiles. We have an apostle to the Gentiles. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He became the mighty apostle to the Gentiles. So I hope this message helps somebody today. This is like the most complicated passage of scripture in the whole Bible. The verses that we're looking at. Three, uh, you know, 18 to 20, right? And so many, so many. I mean, I couldn't even tell you all the things that people say about them. There's so many, okay? Anyway, that's it for today. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful this morning that we could just open this scripture, hopefully help people understand what these verses don't mean, and... Just that should solve a lot of problems. So I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.